Minneapolis. And I had a chance to be at an event at Hamlin University. Hamlin University is a Division III school that my oldest brother coached at for 20 years and 23 years, I guess. And, and uh, uh, he lives back in Minnesota now. He was with us for 10 years at Ohio State. And, and uh, one of our graduate assistants from Ohio State is now the head coach at Hamlin University. And I have a nephew on the staff. So they leaned on me to uh, get involved with a, an event on Saturday in Minneapolis. And then with the weather and whatnot, I had a delayed flight and I got back to Cleveland about midnight on Saturday and, and got up at 4.30 and went to Columbus on Sunday and was in a, a church in Columbus. Uh, we did three services, uh, myself and Maurice Claret. And the pastor, uh, Pastor Ken Murphy, at the Cypress Wesleyan Church in uh, southwest side of Columbus has really been a great mentor to Maurice and, and really made a difference in his life. And, and so he has a church about like this size and, and he had three straight services that we did like a little bit of an interview type thing. And you guys remember the weather on Sunday and, and uh, then I rode back uh, Sunday night and this morning we had a 7.30 a.m. Board of Trustees meeting at the University of Akron. And one thing I've learned about being in academia is that there's lots of meetings and they're long. And so I knew it was gonna be a long day and, and I knew I was excited to be here with all of you. And I, I was probably feeling a little bit sorry for myself so I got to thinking early this morning, I thought back to my late mom and she used to always say, you know, hey, sometimes when you're feeling sorry for yourself, you just have to, you know, pull your pants up and go get a good breakfast and go face the day and, and uh, things will be fine. So I was thinking of her early this morning and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do what mom says. I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna get a great breakfast and get to those board meetings and uh, the board meetings ended about four o'clock today, so we were 7.30 to four, and, and I'm just not capable of all that wisdom that was a part of those board meetings. And so I knew I needed to get a good breakfast, so I went to one of those diners and along the highway there, and, and uh, I thought, you know, Mom said that when you're feeling a little sorry for yourself, you know, you have to just get your attitude up, and you just have to you know, raise up and smile and, and pass along good cheer. And, and uh, so I thought, you know, I'm going to do that. I went to that diner and, and the waitress came up and she looked like I felt. <laughs> she was not happy. She looked like she'd had four or five days like I did. And I said, well, here's my chance. I'm going to do what mom told me. And so she came over and she... You can picture it, one of those highway diners and dressed kind of in white with the apron and she came over, had her coffee pot and she said, can I help you? And I said, yeah. I said, I'm feeling good today. How about you? Can I help you? I said, yeah, you know, I'd like a little coffee, a couple eggs, maybe a few kind words. She didn't smile. She poured my coffee and it was in, you know how the diners, they have those small cups with the saucer and poured it in and, you know, it went in, out, down on the saucer. You pick it up, it drips on you, you know. Kind of walked away to put the order in, came back a few minutes later, plopped the eggs down, looked at me. She said, is there anything else I can get for you? I said, okay, I got to do what mom said now. Got to smile. And I said, well, you know, I'd like a little coffee because really I'd only had like an inch because the rest fell on the saucer. <laughs> so just a little more coffee, please. And uh, how about a few kind words? She looked at me and kind of sat there. And she had the pot here. You can picture it. She had her hand on her hip. She said a few kind words, huh? If I were you, I wouldn't eat those eggs. 
I said, Lord, have mercy. This is going to be a, this is going to be a challenge. But you know what? Like every day when you get to be around good people and uh, one of our board of trustees members partner is here today and we're talking about what a good guy he is and, and, and you get to be around good folks and you get to be thinking about the challenges you have. And you know, there are no greater challenging times today in education than there have ever been. I don't like being in the middle of the pack and right now education in America is in the middle of the pack. There's a lot of the world that's doing better than we are in education. And, and being with good people to try to figure out what we can do to get our students prepared to compete in the rest of the world is a great challenge. And it gives you a whole lot of energy. And you get excited to be around people that are trying to figure out how we can serve and how we can make sure that the young people who are entrusted in our care get the best of the best. So it really was a great day. And then riding down here, down Route 619 and having a chance to think about you good folks who are taking a nice cold evening in your life and coming in fellowship, spend time together, talk about life, remind ourselves that the time we spend in fellowship, the time we spend in being discipled, the time we spend in prayer, the time we spend reading and learning, the time we spend developing relationships, those are so important. And I appreciate so much that you would come out here this evening and appreciate you folks putting this on. And, and you know, it's just, we're so blessed. I met someone here earlier today that uh, had served over in Afghanistan. And I was thinking, you know, how lucky are we to be able to do this, to come here together, to share with one another, talk about what we believe, share with one another anything that might help one another. Not everywhere in the world gets to do this. But because so many men and women over the course of our history have served our country, have sacrificed hundreds of thousands who've lost their lives, and we get to do this. And so for all of you that have served our country, we thank you. Because if it weren't for you, we wouldn't have a chance to do this. And so it's a special night. I was thinking a lot about, you know, I wonder what it is that I could share with you tonight, being a men's group, a lot of young guys here, and I appreciate it. Young guys, most of you don't have school tomorrow. And usually you're in school about six or seven hours. So we're gonna spend six or seven hours tonight. <laughs> okay, so settle in. And I thought about, you know, what would be something that I could share with you? And I know all of you guys that are in the adult stage of your life, I know there have been times, many times, that you've said to yourself, okay, at this moment in my life, what is it that is God's will for me? What should I be doing? You know, what's my purpose? Am I doing what I was called to do? And for the young people, the beauty of going to school is having that curiosity to think about what is it as my life goes on that I'll be able to contribute to this world that we live in. I've always felt that one of the most important traits that our players needed to have, one of the most important traits that our students at the University of Akron need to have if they really want to excel, is to be curious. They really need to think about how they can make a difference, about what would excite them, what would fulfill them, what they could do for others, how they could get better. 
Curiosity is so important. I've had teams sometimes that were rolling along, doing really well, but they just weren't a curious bunch as to how they could get better. And so they listened when someone told them, oh, you're, you're going to win the conference or, or you're going to be ranked number one or you're going to be the champions. And, and they, they listened to that and they believed it and they kind of fell into the trap that it was going to be easy, that they'd already proved themselves and they lost their curiosity as to how they could get better. Because you know the competition is going to get better. And that's the thrill at working at a university. The thrill at working at a school is you know that the world out there looks at the United States and wants the things that we are fortunate to have and they want to be better than us. Just like when you're the team up here, you can be sure that everybody has got their sights set on you. I know that when we went to Youngstown State back in 1986, we were in the Ohio Valley Conference, and the team to beat was Eastern Kentucky. And everything that we did, we looked at Eastern Kentucky because they had been champions of the league. They had gone to the playoffs. They had been national champions. We targeted them, and we said, we're going to do what they do, but we're going to do it even better. We were curious as to what it would take to become the champions. And then about four or five years into our time there, at Eastern Kentucky beat us our first year and, and beat us our second year. And then our fourth year, we had a chance to play them in the national playoffs. And it was the second playoff game. We had won the first round and it was the second round. No, I take it back. It was the first round. It was at Eastern Kentucky. They'd won 28 straight games at home. They were the team that we were targeting. They were the team that we were curious as to what we needed to do to get at that level. And I'll never forget going to that game. And I think we were down 14 to 7 or something at the half and ended up winning the game and took that step because our guys were curious. It, it allowed us to move up and then a year or two later, we're playing for four straight national championships because our guys were very curious as to what it would take to be champions. So I appreciate all the young guys that are in here that are curious about, you know, what do I need to do as I go forward in life? to succeed in perhaps my sports or my vocation, my ability to be a good son, maybe someday a good husband, a good father, curious as to what it will take. And I really think that that's got to be one of those traits we have. As I said, I had some teams that were good. They lost their curiosity. I had some teams that were average, but all they wanted to do was figure out how they could get better. I had some teams that were very good, and they ended up being champions because they wouldn't rest on their laurels as to the level they were at. They were always wanting to get better. They were always happy enough to be satisfied with life, but not so happy that they couldn't keep getting better. So I appreciate you being here. And I wanted to share really two different things with you tonight. One might be more scaled for us older folks, and, and one might speak to all of us. And the first one that I thought about sharing with you is I like probably most of you have thought often about, am I doing today what God wants me to do? Not really what God needs me to do, because God really doesn't need me. He'd be fine without me. But what would he like me to do? What's his will for me? How can I feel good about where I am, 
what I'm doing, how I'm serving him, how I'm serving others. How can I figure that out? And I remember reading one time as I was going through that thought process about, is this what I should be doing? I remember reading an author who wrote about, in his opinion, there were four things that had to be in place if you're gonna feel good about where you are at this moment, what you're doing at this moment, what effect you're having at this moment. And the four things that he wrote about made a lot of sense to me. And I've shared them with a number of people and I apologize if I've shared them with you before. But they made a lot of sense to me and we'll see if they do to you. The first thing he said that if you can check off the fact that this is indeed in order in your life, you're going to be one step toward feeling good about doing God's will. And he said the first thing is, is that you've got to feel good about your connectedness, meaning who you're around. You've got to feel good about your family. You've got to feel good about your friends. You've got to feel good about your church. You've got to feel good about the people that are helping you grow spiritually. You've got to feel good about the people that are helping you grow professionally, your mentors, your bosses, whatever. You've got to feel good about your community. I think that's why people like sports, because they like to be connected to something. I talked to folks here tonight, Buckeye fans, Zip fans, Youngstown State fans. There's a couple uh, Baldwin Wallace guys out here. The Marlington guys talking about their team. Feeling good about who they're connected with. I think people love sports because sports does embody team. Connectedness, being together. And so if you feel good about who you're with, that's a huge first step in feeling good about who you are and what you're doing. Just yesterday, yesterday Sunday? Yeah, just yesterday, Maurice Claret shared with the group we were talking to about something that he had shared with the NFL rookies this summer. He and I went over to the NFL rookie symposium where all the draft choices were together and they were having a little seminar about the difference between taking that step from college football to the NFL and all of the pitfalls and all of the challenges, all of the difficulties, all of the exciting things. And they brought Maurice in to talk a little bit about the mistakes he made, which he was more than willing to talk about, and maybe give them some food for thought so maybe they wouldn't make some of those mistakes. And the theme of his talk with the rookies was, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And we could take that even broader. Show me who you're connected with, who's a part of your life, and I'll show you your future. Are you connected with your church? Are you connected with others that will help you grow spiritually? Are you connected with the right people in the whatever vocation it is? You guys that are in school, are you hanging around with the right guys, the right girls, the people who are doing the right things, making the right decisions, walking away from the wrong things. Are you connected with the right people? Do you feel good about who you're connected with? If you do, check that box off and you're one step closer to feeling good about who you are and what you're doing at this particular moment. The second thing that this writer talked about and it might not relate to the younger guys here, but I think those of us that are beyond school, this will relate to, is he said, everyone needs 
a sense of autonomy, meaning everyone needs a role that is needed, that he or she is in charge of and knows everyone else is counting on them. Just like if you're playing defense, every defense that you play, I love it when I hear the broadcasters talk about, should we be 3-4 or 4-3, or should we blitz, or should we do that? You know what? Every defense that is designed is engineered for success. But it's got to have someone in every gap, or covering every receiver, or in every zone, and everyone on that defense has to know first and foremost that they are insignificant without the other 10. Because it doesn't matter how well they do at their job, if the other 10 aren't doing it, we're not gonna have a defense. And that's when you see the run go out the gate or the pass get open or whatever it happens to be. And so, we all need to have that sense of autonomy that they're counting on me to do this job. They, they can count on me to be in this gap. They can count on me to be in this zone. They can count on me on offense to make this block or to pick up this blitz or at the job site do my particular job. And all of us need to know that we're needed and we all need that autonomy that we can be responsible for what needs to be done for the job that we're called upon. I remember when I was an assistant coach and everyone knew the players' names, everyone knew the head coach's name, not many people knew the assistant coach's name, but I knew this. I knew that the team needed me to coach my position. At Ohio State, I had the quarterbacks and receivers. I knew that I had to make sure my quarterbacks and receivers were doing what they needed to do on every play, at every moment, on and off the field. That was my responsibility. And I got to figure out what we were gonna discuss in the meetings, what we were gonna practice in our individual drills. That was my autonomy. And I knew the team needed me to do that job so that those guys were good. I also knew that the team needed me to recruit my area. I might have had Northeast Ohio. And my job was to select the right type guys from Northeast Ohio for us to recruit and I could figure out the plans as to how do we evaluate them, check their transcripts, young people. The first thing we always checked when we were deciding whether or not we were gonna recruit someone was, is we looked at their transcript and we checked number one, attendance. If you're not there, it's tough for you to help. I'm sure the same is true with anyone here that's involved in a company. If the person's not there, they can't help us. Second thing we checked was how many times were they tardy? Because you know what? We need every minute to get the job done. We need them to be responsible, to be there on time. And then of course, we checked their grades. And in particular, I liked to check math. Two reasons. One, math is tough. I wanted to see if they were willing to take the tough courses and see how they did in the tough courses. And I also liked math because so much of football was reactionary. If this happens, then this. If they're in this coverage, then we gotta throw it there. If they're blitzing, then we gotta do this. Well, the if-then problem solving in math, specifically geometry, I liked my guys to enjoy that challenge. And so I got to make those plans as to who we were gonna go recruit in my area, what we were gonna do to make my position right, and that I knew the team was counting on me, and I didn't wanna let the team down. 
And then as time progressed, I became a head coach and I knew how much I valued having some autonomy. And so I made sure that I tried as hard as I could not to micromanage what my people were doing because I knew they needed to know they could plan and I knew they needed to know that we were counting on them and it was going to be on them and there's something exciting about being counted on and if you like who you're connected with and you know you're needed and you know you get to to have that chess game that challenge that that mental exercise of planning out how you are going to do your responsibility then in my mind you're two steps closer to really feeling good about what you're doing where you are at that moment people have asked all the time throughout my career did you always dream about being a head coach well you know what when I was an assistant coach I was glued in on being the best assistant coach I could be and I don't I don't remember waking up in the morning saying boy I wish I were a head coach now when opportunities came up later on after I had been a head coach or an assistant coach 11 years started thinking about gosh I learned this from Jim Dennison I learned these things from Tom Reed I learned these things from Dick McPherson I learned these things from Earl Bruce man someday maybe I'd like to see if I could be the head coach but you know what I got to keep my focus on what I need to get done and then when I was at Youngstown State everyone asked oh did you always dream of going to Ohio State you know I didn't dream at all about going to Ohio State because I was so focused in on what was it that I could do at Youngstown State in fact quite honestly I used to think there in the in the mid 90s and stuff and you hear all the talk radio and all the various things I used to think what fool would want to be the head coach at Ohio State? Man, they're killing that poor guy. And they've asked me here in the last two or three weeks, oh, are you going to the Detroit Lions? Are you going to the Cleveland Browns? Do you wake up in the morning thinking about that? Honestly, right now I wake up in the morning thinking about how are we going to recruit 5,000 more students to Akron this year? Because that's what we need. How are we going to make sure the 27,000 students are successful and focused on the things that I could do and the autonomy I had and the responsibilities I had the head or excuse me the athletic director at uh, University of Akron when I was hired Jim Dennison hired me as a graduate assistant I had a 30-second interview with the athletic director his name was Gordon Larson and Wally and Jim you remember Gordon he was kind of a rough guy Gordon Larson said sit down young man I said yes sir and I'm gonna paraphrase what he said because we're in a house of God and he said I only have one piece of advice for you keep your mind and your rear end in the same place wherever it is you're sitting you better be keeping your mind right there and I can't tell you how many times I referred back to that when we all have those daydreams or whatever to get back to what is it that I've got to do so that that autonomy that I've been granted I'm able to contribute to the team what needs to be done the third thing that this author said that we really need to have to feel good about who we are and what we're doing kind of surprised me but as I now think about it it makes perfect sense he said if you feel good about how you feel if you feel good about how you feel if you feel good physically if you're getting proper rest oh we talked about that all the time with our players because here they are they're in college now mom and dad aren't there no one's telling them they got to turn the light out and go to bed 
No one's telling them when they have to get back to the dorm. Yet, on the other hand, they're talking about they want to be first string or they want to be all Big Ten or they want to win the national championship, they want to go to the NFL, all that. Well, you know what? You've got to get your rest to do that. You've got to get your rest. If you want to build your body, if you want to build your mind, one thing for sure that your body and your mind need is rest. And you're going to feel better when you're rested. You're going to feel better when your diet is correct. You're going to feel better when you exercise. You're going to feel better when you train. I don't care if you're in college, high school, or out in the workforce. The better you feel, the better you'll do your job. And maybe more important than any of that, you're really not going to feel very good if you put the wrong things in your body. Alcohol, drugs, the wrong kind of food. If you put the wrong things in your body, you are not going to function as well. You are not going to feel as good. You are not going to feel good about who you are and what you're doing in whatever challenge you're in if you don't feel good. We all know that those times when, when we're under the weather or whatever, we don't feel as good. We just don't get the job done as well as we could. If we really want to feel good about who we are, what we're doing, we've got to feel good. We've got to get our rest. We've got to eat right. We've got to train. He asked the question, he said, think back to one of the times that you just had a great performance or a great year. He said, I'll bet you it was at a time when you were really feeling good. And it was amazing. When he issued that challenge, I thought back. And I thought back to our sixth year at Youngstown State. We had been working like mad, getting better and better and better, but we still had not reached the top of the mountain. We wanted to be the national champions. That was our goal. And we had gotten close. We'd been in the playoffs, all those things, but we had not gotten there. And we had worked. And we had probably worked too many hours. We had probably watched too much film. We'd probably done some things that didn't make us feel good. We were probably a little bit fatigued. And I remember going in to the year in 1991, the year before we were 11 and 0, and then we got beat in the playoffs. It was like, oh, and we'd worked so hard. And we just, like one more, maybe we should have studied one more film, or we should have practiced one, a little bit more, we should have done this or that. I remember going into 1991, I said to myself, you know what? I don't know if you can work harder than my guys are working. I don't know if I can work harder than I'm doing. In fact, I'm not so sure that I'm not working a little bit too much. So I made a commitment that every day at noon, I was gonna tell our guys, put the film down, put the recruiting things aside, go out and I don't care what you do, if you walk, swim, jog, I don't care, but I want you to get into a little bit of a fitness regimen so that we feel good at two o'clock when our players get here and the meetings start and the practice starts and we have our finest three hours of the day are in the back half of the day. That's not when we're, we don't wanna be tired when they come in because we've been grinding and watching one more film and you hear all the stories about the NFL coaches that sleep in the office at night and all that. I told our guys, I want your best three hours when those players get here. And so that year before, we'd been undefeated, man. We were rolling, lost in the playoffs. The next year I said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of ourselves. Put up a big chart in the coach's room. I said, I want your weight charted. Every day I want you to chart your weight from the beginning of preseason camp through the national championship game. I wanna make sure that you have been eating right, and you have been exercising, you have been getting your rest. 
So with that great proclamation, we started out the year and we were four and three. But you know what was interesting? You could tell we were getting better and you could just see in our coaches that they were given the best three hours of the day to those players when they got there. And you could tell there was a little confidence about us. Well, we were four and three getting ready to go to Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern had won like four of the last six national championships. And we're going to play them at Georgia Southern. They're 55 and two at home since they built their new stadium. And we're four and three. But for whatever reason, going into that game eight, I felt good. I mean, I just felt good. I'd been exercising. I'd been knocking it off. Coach Dennison used to have a rule, which was nothing works that you put in the game plan if you put it in past 10 o'clock at night. So we had a rule. You're going home at 10 o'clock at night. We had a rule. You're going to exercise at noon. And there was a confidence about all of us. There was a feeling about all of us that we felt good. And I know we were four and three and we shouldn't have lost that game and we messed up on this game and we didn't have a good plan or whatever. All of a sudden we go down to Georgia Southern and we beat Georgia Southern down there, big upset and roll eight straight and win the national championship. And so when I read that fella's question or challenge that think back to some outstanding performance, outstanding year, outstanding six months or whatever you've had, and he said, I'll bet you it was at a time when you were feeling good. For the young guys, I'll bet you when you do well in school, it's when you're fresh, rested, feeling good. All of us out in the workforce, we are going to perform better when we feel better. And we most certainly are going to feel better about who we are, what we're doing, where we are in life, if we're feeling better. Now that's a challenge because I can promise you from 1991 to today, I haven't had, however, 23 straight years of feeling good, rested, eating right. In fact, I ate way too many sausage tonight. And it's also funny that I'll go for a while and I'll exercise and I'll get good rest and all that stuff and, and I'll say, man, I am never gonna get off this regimen. I mean, I, because this feels so good to feel good. And then wouldn't you know it, you got this, this, this happens, boom, boom, boom. All of a sudden you fell off the wagon. And you say, oh man, I gotta get back to feeling good. I gotta get some rest. I gotta get out there and exercise a little bit. I gotta make sure I'm eating better. And then you do that and you say, okay, never again will this happen where I fall off the wagon, but it does. But we've got to remind ourselves to make sure that we pay attention to how we feel. That's so critical. And I happen to agree with that author that you know what? If you feel good about who you're around and if you know you're important, and you get to have a part of the plan to do your role, and you feel good, man, that's, that's three major steps toward feeling good about how things are going. And then lastly, if we're gonna feel good about what we're doing, what the situation is, we're gonna have to have proper perspective. We're gonna to have to understand where what we're doing fits into the big picture. I used to think, in fact, I used to feel a little guilty at times at Ohio State where when we'd lose a game, like the Ohio State fans were like, life as they knew it had ended. It was like they were gonna die, we lost a game and that, you know, they were just miserable. Oh my gosh, you know, oh, just misery overtook the state of Ohio. 
And I used to feel guilty that they felt worse than I did. I mean, I knew why we lost. We fumbled. We missed the tackles. The other guys beat us. But I also felt that I knew in perspective that it wasn't a tragedy that we lost. It was a game we lost. It wasn't like when you have a player murdered or a player loses mom or whatever other real life tragedies that occur. And so if you feel good about what you're doing, you've got to make sure that you've got it in perspective. And I used to have a little thing, I still do, sitting on my dresser that I tried to read as often as I could. Because you can lo lose perspective when you're around sports. Because sports gets talked about so much and so much idolatry and pats on the back if you win and, and you know, rings and trophies. And, and I mean, you can get tricked into thinking that that is the most important thing in the world. So this little thing that I keep on my dresser is a reminder for me about what perspective is to help me keep things in proper order. And it's a little verse about a Hall of Fame, which was, I could relate to because, you know, we were involved in sports and in sports, the Hall of Fame is like the ultimate. I was over at the enshrinement uh, this summer. I took 100 University of Akron students that were in summer school. And is this a Michigan guy leaving? Okay. He's getting more sausage. He really liked my speech about diet. But anyway. Where were we? Yeah, but there was something else we were. Oh, yeah. We took 100 students over here to the uh, enshrinement. And I said, I want you guys to hear these guys talk about the excitement of, of obtaining that excellence and what it took. Because I knew what they were going to talk about. They were going to talk about their families. They were going to talk about their faith. They were going to talk about their teammates. They were going to talk about their coaches. They weren't even going to talk about themselves. Because they were at that point where they understood how blessed they were to be in the Hall of Fame. Well, this little piece that I try to read about the Hall of Fame goes like this. It says, the Hall of Fame is only good as long as time shall be. But keep in mind, God's Hall of Fame is for eternity. To have your name inscribed up there is greater more by far than all the praise and all the fame of any man-made star. Now, that's perspective. Yeah, football's important, it's big in our culture. Although I did remind our guys often that if you go anywhere in the world and say you play football, they think you play soccer. So you're not quite as important as you think you are. And yes, to all of us, our businesses are important. You know, we have to make a living. Yes. Our things are important. But where are they in perspective? Really what's important? Really where do we invest our time? And that's why I can't thank you guys enough to come here on a Monday night with the thought in mind of fellowshipping and learning and sharing and where do we spend our time? Do we have things in perspective? One thing we asked our guys to do every morning, we'd get to the football facility and we would sit 
in the team meeting room together and we spent our first 15 minutes in quiet time. Because I happen to believe that how you spend your first hour of the day is going to direct the path of your day. In fact, we had a little quote that said, the first hour of the day is the rudder of the day. Then I realized most of my guys didn't know what a rudder was. And every year when we started, we'd say to one of the freshmen, we'd say, tell the guy, come here, young man. Yeah. We need one of these microphones here. We'd have one of our freshmen, we'd say, tell the rest of the team, go ahead, take that. What is a rudder? I don't know what a rudder is. You got to know what a rudder is. You're just like my guys. Get out of here. <laughs> All right, now, here's what a rudder is. If you've learned nothing else tonight, young people, the rudder is that back part of the boat that when you turn it, it directs where the boat goes. You ever heard of a rudder? You just didn't know it was called a rudder, okay? The first hour of the day is the rudder for the day. Whatever direction the first hour of the day takes is the direction that the day will take. And so we started every day with quiet time. And the only thing mandatory in that quiet time, well, there's two things. One, be quiet. And two, you had to write down one thing in your winner's manual book that we had one thing that you were grateful for. And that was up to you. You could be grateful it's school's canceled tomorrow. You know, whatever. Grateful for your parents. Grateful for your teammates. Grateful my ankle feels better today. It doesn't matter. Grateful for my high school coach. Whatever. Every day, we wanted them to begin their day in quiet, beginning with writing one thing down that they're grateful for, and then the next 12 to 14 minutes, all they had to do was be quiet. If they wanted to be in prayer, that's fine. You got that sausage? How about my guy? He's, my name's not Dave. That's for Dave. I stole it off of Dave. Oh, sorry, Dave. Hey, does that mean I'm done? I just had a couple more things. Man, there goes my feeling good. But the next 12 to 14 minutes, all we asked them to do was spend it in quiet, reflection, prayer. We had certain chapters in our book. We had a different word for the day. Perhaps read from that. And then once we were done with that quiet, we would spend five to eight minutes and we would talk about something. We'd call on one of the guys, say, hey, you know, hey, George, is there anything that you thought about today or you read about today that spoke to you that you would like to share with the group? And so we'd spend five, six, seven minutes, eight minutes just kind of sharing so that we could begin the day with the proper perspective. And never in the course of that discussion did we talk about X's and O's or who we were playing that week or were we going to win the game or where were we ranked or any of that stuff. We talked about things that were bigger than that. We wrote about things that were bigger than that because we wanted our guys to have perspective. Yes, we wanted to be the best we could be. We never apologized for winning. We wanted to win. We wanted to be the best we could be. But we wanted our lives in perspective. And I think if we all know what's most important in our lives and if we invest our time accordingly, if we have the discipline to spend time in prayer, to spend time reading, 
reading scripture, to spend time with others who can mentor us or disciple us, help us grow in the things that are important in our life. I can assure you that the thing that has helped me more than anything get through difficult times is being able to hold God's hand. And the thing that has been able to help me get through times where we were kind of tricked that everything was wonderful was making sure we brought it back down to perspective and kept a hold of God's hand. There's not anything we can't handle. There's not anything that will upset our apple cart if we have things in perspective. If we know the beauty of God's Hall of Fame, you know, at the NFL Hall of Fame, they only let, what, five or six guys in every year? And thousands play. We can all be in God's Hall of Fame. And as we talked at the Rock the Park, the neat thing about God's Hall of Fame is it's pretty simple. He wants us to have a relationship with Him. He wants us to get to know Him, have a relationship, spend time with Him. We get all busy in life and so forth, and, and we think one thing's more important than the other, and then when Mom gets sick, we're there like every day for however many days in a row. Because we, we realize what's important. So if we have perspective in our life, we can handle any of the challenges. So I think that writer is pretty spot on. You know what, if you feel good about who you're around, young guys know that show me your friends, I'll show you your future. If we all do know that we're a valuable part of the team. Coach Paterno used to always say, do you want to evaluate the morale of a team? He said, go find the person with the least perceived role. The person that no one's ever heard of, might not even get in the game, might not even be good enough to get on the scout squad to practice against the first ring because he can't quite do it well enough to give us a good look. Might have the least perceived role. That person's role might be only one of encouragement. He said, find that person with the least perceived role, and if they feel good about how they're being treated, if they feel good about being, just being part of that team, doing whatever it is they can do for that team, chances are the morale of the rest of the people who are getting some of the nice things, like playing in game day or notoriety or whatever, they'll, they'll be fine. If that person with the least perceived role feels that they're an important part of that team, they're needed, their job, whatever it is, however insignificant it may look. One thing we would evaluate when we would watch the film from on top of a game on Saturday is we would always evaluate and grade, was our sideline alive? Did our sideline have intensity? Because if your sideline's got intensity, it gives energy to the people out in that game. But no one knows who all is a part of that sideline that's creating that energy and that intensity. It doesn't matter what others know. We all knew that they were critical and that if our sideline was alive, that energy would generate into the guys playing and the coaches coaching, and that would make a difference because that person knew whatever it was was their job was important and that the rest of us were insignificant without them. So that autonomy is critical. That feeling good is critical. And obviously that perspective, knowing where we fit in the big picture the last thing I wanted to share real quick, Pastor, I don't want to, Pastor's looking at his watch. Am I all right? Do I got another minute? No, you got as much time as you want. 
That's right, we don't have school tomorrow. No school, no school tomorrow. All right, this is second period. Okay. <laughs> Since we have some young guys in the audience, I wanted to share with you what we talked to our young guys about when they would talk about wanting to be a leader. You know, that word leadership gets thrown around a lot. And people like to have the opportunity to lead. And we worked hard at helping our people understand that leadership is not a position or a rank. Captain, head coach, lieutenant colonel, it's not a rank. Leadership is an action that you take to serve others. That's what leadership is. Leadership is what your willingness to do to serve others. If we all think back, and 99% of us in here are men, if we think back to who the greatest leader was in our lives, our personal lives, chances are it was our mother. Because you know what? She didn't need to have a title or a rank. All she wanted to do was serve us. I have said many times that the beauty of my mother, and these two guys will know it sitting here, my mother woke up every morning trying to figure out who she could help. And that's just what she did. Whether it was helping us, her sons, or whether it was helping someone at Baldwin Wallace College or Maslin High School or Mentor High School where my dad coached, she was going to wake up in the morning figuring out who she could serve. She was the greatest leader that I've ever been around. And so if you want to be looked to as a leader, effective as a leader, I think you need to understand that leadership is not a rank. It's an action that you take. And if you're willing to take that service action, then you'll have a chance to impact as you would hope any leader does. And so after we tried to help our people understand that, we told them that there are a couple characteristics then that if you'll agree to the fact that what you want to do is serve others, then there's some things that you have to kind of traits that you have to have. And one is that you have to take a risk. And you have to say, here's the way that we should do things. Here's the standard at which we're going to carry ourselves. Here's the things that if you'll partner with me, if you will, we're going to do some great things. Some extraordinary, we're going to be champions. You have to take a risk. And you have to say, this is the standard that we're going to hold. And then after you've taken that risk, we would always then say to them, if you've gone out on Front Street and said, hey, here's how I would like to serve you, here's the standard which we're keep, here's the direction that we should go, here's how we're gonna do it, then you better understand you're now responsible for every action that you take. Every action you take, because you've said to the group, I wanna serve you. I want to demonstrate. I want to be an example. People talk about leadership by example. I want to be the example. Well, once you've gone out and said and demonstrated that that's what you're going to be, now you're responsible for every single thing that you say and do. And boy, is that hard now for you young people. They didn't have YouTube and cell phones and Instagrams and all that stuff. When we were growing up, 
fact, there might be some of us that'd be in jail right now if they had cell phones and Instagrams and YouTubes. So it's tough. But you have to be responsible for every action, every word, everything that you do, if you truly want to lead. Think back to your mom. I mean, she clearly said, hey, this is the way that this family's going to do it. And think back, every action she took, she was clearly responsible for. Could clearly stand behind it. Thirdly, we would say to them, okay, you've said you want to serve. That means you want to serve forever. And so you as a leader, you as a servant, must never quit. How many of us did mom never quit on us? No matter how ornery, how many mistakes, how many whatever. A leader can't quit. I don't care if we're down 28 nothing in the first quarter. I don't care if we're, if we're uh, one group told me today they're five and eight in their season so far. You know what? We'll find out now if we have leaders. It's a lot easier for folks to be leaders when you're 13 and 0. But boy, you really find out about who is willing to serve the others when you're five and eight. Leadership really expresses itself. They used to ask us all the time at the beginning of the season, because we used to preach, that we will probably be as good as our senior leadership, because they've got more experiences. They understand it more. We're going to be as good as they are. Then the sports writers would say, well, do you think you'll have that senior leadership? And you had to answer, I don't know. We'll wait until something tough happens. We'll wait until the ball bounces the other way. We'll wait until it looks like we're not going to maybe reach the ultimate goals that we had. We'll find out if we've got leaders, people willing to serve till the end. A leader never quits. And then lastly, we would say to them is that a leader, a true servant, has a sense of impending greatness. There's just something about them that some people, you know, call them a natural leader or people just naturally follow them or naturally allow them to serve them. A leader just has a sense of impending greatness. That if you'll stick with me, if you'll let me serve you, if you'll walk with me, something great's going to happen. And that's why we need men of God. Because men of God will serve, no matter how bleak it looks. Men of God are responsible for all their actions. And thank goodness, when all of us have erred, God loves us despite that and wants us to keep serving despite that. Men of God, no matter what, never quit. They never quit. They're the ones you can always count on, no matter what's going on. And that there's something about, in the school, you can tell those young men of God. In corporate world or in the town or whatever it happens to be, you can just tell. And I believe that we're charged not with beating anyone over the head and say, hey, you should believe like I believe. I think what we're charged with is to have that sense of impending greatness that if you'll allow me to serve you, if you will follow me really by following the God that leads me, something great's going to happen. And so there's nothing we need more in our society today than strong leaders, servants, men of God. And that's what's so exciting about being with you tonight is 
You didn't have to be out here. You didn't have to be sharing with one another. You obviously want to be a difference maker. You want to obviously do whatever it is you can for the good of the whole. And I'll leave you with one last thought. You know, sometimes it's tense and nervous times. These, there's some adverse times and there's some anxious times. And one of those times for us always happened to be right before the game. Because it was like, gosh, we're done preparing. There's nothing else we can be working on to keep our mind off the nervousness of kickoff. But there's really no time left for that. There's no more time left for preparation. And now the only thing there's time left for is to be nervous. That last 10 minutes before you go out on the field, man, you're nervous. I mean, if you're not nervous, I'd be shocked. And the last thing that we tried to do, knowing how nervous each of us were, knowing how hard each of us had prepared, knowing how much those 106,000 people out there wanted to win, and those millions of people watching on TV, how much they were just on the edge of their seats waiting to see how we would do. It was a nervous time. And so we wanted to make sure that we took a deep breath and reminded one another of what we needed from one another as we went onto that field. After we prayed together, we said a short poem together, which was just a reminder that no matter how nervous you are, or how nervous we all are about what's going on in the world as we walk out the door tonight. I mean, it's, ner it's nerve-wracking times. No matter how nervous we are about that, if we'll keep this in mind, then I think we'll be fine with the results. And that was simply this. We had a poem that we said together that was written by Edward Everett Hale and it was about seven or eight stanzas, but this was before the game. We were nervous and we weren't very smart, so we, we memorized the first verse. And we said it together to remind ourselves of what we need from one another. And I would suggest to you as we leave tonight that we need the same thing from one another as we needed when we walked down that tunnel. And the poem was real short and real simple, and it went like this. It said, I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And that I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I shall do. And really, that's all we can expect of one another as we go out and back into our respective lives in tough times, in challenging times. In my mind, it's a tougher world for these younger guys than it was for us coming out 40-some years ago. It's a tougher time. But the good news is this. God will always be with us. And really all we need from one another is whatever it is we can do. And we know for sure we can love one another, we can care for one another, we can lead slash serve one another. There are so many things that we can do. And if we'll all be willing to do that, I think we'll be fine with the results. Thanks so much. God bless you. Go Bucks, go Zips, go Penguins, go Purple Raiders, go Yellow Jackets, all the people here, go Marlington Dukes. God bless. You didn't fall asleep on me, did you? No. Huh? Okay.
Well, before we're dismissed, let me close this in prayer. And before I close this in prayer, let me make one announcement. I hear that the parking lot is slippery, so be careful on your way out. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the delicious food that we had. We thank you for the fellowship that we enjoyed. We thank you for Coach Trestle and his life and his influence and his leadership. And we pray your continued blessing upon him. Please give us traveling mercies as we travel home and let us put into practice some of the teachings that Coach gave us tonight. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.